express my deepest appreciation to the organizers of the Georgetown Literary Festival who have striven all these years to make this festival, if not one of the grandest, then certainly one of the most unique and distinctive of festivals in the map of literary festivals today. It was in 1970 that Gabriela Garcia Marquez, skinny, thickly moustached, and with a, with a lit cigarette, took on a platform not unlike this one to make the clearest declaration of his writing life. At the Athenium in Caracas, he confessed, I began to be a writer in the same way I was cursed. I would like to say, three of the last century's sublime artists. I am precisely the height of Bruce Lee. Just an inch taller than that irrepressible Argentine Diego Maradona. And possessing the exact measurement of that fabulous, furious right foot of our great local hero, Mokta Dari. Growing up, my dreams, and today I would have made my failed ambitions, lay elsewhere. To kind of phrase the right school then, I began to be a writer in the same way I climbed up on this platform. I was looking the other way. And so I find myself standing here in the shadow of a dear friend and word guide, Rema Rashi. Just a few years ago, as the world experienced its severest financial meltdown in decades, a very striking photograph was published in the world's press. Voyeuristic in attitude, it featured in long lens and through the jaws of thin grapes, the French president Nicolas Sarkozy in his personal study at the Palais Elysee, unjacketed and poring over a massive tome. That book was Karl Marx's Das Kapital, which in 2009, precisely a decade after having been lampooned, flayed, derided, and decried, was returning with a vengeance to remind us all that following the euphoria of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the crumbling of the Iron Curtain, we, all of us, including self-professed Marxists, might just have been, all along, reading Marx wrong. The photograph is instructive and telling for all sorts of reasons, but principally to remind us that the capital of ideas and the sum total of human experience can never be fully replaced. A romanticization, an idealization perhaps, but also a stubborn affirmation of faith in word and book in this age of insufferable mediocrity. We gather here under the burden of a KD theme, capital. We gather here on the island of Penang, based on my ancestry and a living, pulsating, and even more living and pulsating since 2008. <laughs> living pulsating testament to the term cosmopolis, which really encapsulates the meeting place of human capital in all its wildness, vastity, and energy. We gather also in Malaysia at a time when we here grapple painfully with the daily debasement of the common language as our collective conversation degenerates to the most reductive of phrases gathered from the dictionary of but also in the contemporary world, I feel very much like Stephen Dedalus in that great fantastic poem that is Ulysses, professing history is a nightmare from which I am trying to wake. I will admit to being loath to attend literary festival, reminding myself always that my hero, James Joyce, will not be caught dead at one. There is also the careerism that passes for much of literature today and that I don't associate with, that is all too evident at such events. What more in tropical climates where the image of broken mangoes, arranged marriages, sound feet, sights, sounds, smells, and the pouring of grandmother's stories have made very real Wallace Schenker's caution decades ago of the dangers of neo Calvinism, when the slaves who willingly place the shackles on their own feet for a full contract from there. As we discuss the theme capital, I am reminded of the very poetic allusion to Perseus that is to be found in the preface of Das Kapital. 
Perseus wore a magic cap that the monsters he hunted down might not see him. We draw the magic cap down over eyes and ears as a make belief that there are no monsters. And of the very real spectre that we are losing so much of the capital of religion, that is language, as we pull down the cap over our eyes, ignore the monsters of mediocrity, and puff ourselves with the Buddhisms of literature. We debate, for example, at the prospect of translation, not sagely at how important it is for us to acknowledge a shared cultural heritage in a world that is nevertheless becoming increasingly monolingual, and that too for reasons of pure communication. But how many would find the energy to learn another or yet another language, commit themselves to translation and bring it about in real terms that shared cultural heritage? Often, I feel like the blind Borges, who said of writers and the literature is high. When I read writing today, I get the sense that I'm reading astronomers who have never seen the stars. A couple of months ago, I was asked to talk about poetry and bear the witness, at least one of the uh, persons who uh, took part in the session this year today. I thought I'll repeat that again because poetry is the essence of literature and language for me. Uh, and I find the art of poetry and the art testament of bearing witness incredibly difficult. Uh, but when contemplating that elusive being, the muse, now so rarely invoked, the painter Edgar Degas said, muses work all day long, and then at night they get together and dance. They do not speak. As if to master a stubborn defense against Adorno's only misquoted dictum that there can be no poetry after Auschwitz, much of the poetry of today has willfully bequeathed itself the opposite task of bearing witness to just about everything, and thus run the risk of perhaps speaking too much. There is poetry for politics, poetry for justice, there is poetry for the unrepresented, and always poetry for the misrepresented, poetry for preservation, poetry against starvation, poetry about whether that is actually poetry. Most recently, it was brought to my attention that in Malaysia, a poetry competition dedicated to the theme of turtle conservation had just been inaugurated. Don't kill them, enough said, is the very reason of the vision of a dear friend in the Bible. The problem of poetry today, as in literature, is, it would seem, is very relevant. Also, the poetry of today would have itself believed. Trust Bell Brecht when he says, and I paraphrase. When there is occupation, poetry will definitely come about the occupation. And the preciousness that much of poetry and literature repeats itself today will disappear. The little of what has been said may appear exotic, quaint, or just plain stupid in this age of literary and poetic careerism. But my faith in the mysteries and magic of poetry was so early in poetry life upon reading a beautiful collection of essays by that fine and majestic poet hardly read today, whose name is Peter Levy. The title of that book, The Noise Made by Poems. Also by the words of faith, expressed by a master puppeteer in a small village in the northeast Malaysian state of Plata, Dara Abdullah Ibrahim, who said, always trust in the power of incantation for its own sake. So powerful was his message that he was summarily proscribed by the Islamic party-led government of that state. Yet, for all the other and self-important importance much of poetry and literature pre preoccupies itself with today, the most widely read poet in the world remains a 13th century Sufi mystic called Rumi. There is perhaps much that can still be said about the sublimation that still belongs to the experience that is the literary life. Does poetry bear witness? Does literature bear witness? Undoubtedly. And principally in its power to regenerate language, to reanimate experience, to inspire chaos of feeling, and to commemorate. There is a lovely phrase in the old Malay, devoted to the experience of translation. Per Alehan 
the confluence of time. And in the old Malay, every act of commemoration is remembered orally, in incantation and verse, giving birth to the proverbial noise. In this direct witness, there is of course place for the poetry of politics, poetry for justice, poetry for the unrepresented and misrepresented, poetry for preservation, poetry against starvation, poetry about whether that is actually poetry. There is even place for poetry dedicated to the conservation of children. What then is the dispute? A noted shaman from a small village in Kalantan may well afford the answer. When asked why he was considered a master shaman among his peers, he simply replied, I do the same thing. I sing, I speak, I dance, I seduce. I just do it better. Some years ago, I was asked a desert island list question in a silly questionnaire. What would be the one book you would take with you to a desert island? My answer was unequivocal. Samuel Beckett, waiting for the book. Strange choice for a poet was a response. Why, I replied, poets live off ambivalence, or they ought to. In all this daring of witness, in poetry, in literature, in the creative life, I still always fall back on that lucid remark by W. H. Warner, a poet I always love, and who has always remained as clear as I can be. Poetry might be defined as the clear expression of things to be. I thank you all very much.